Hi everyone, I'm Dr. McMurtry and I do a variety of nerve and spine and joint interventions amongst other things and I've just seen several cases of ulnar nerve pathologies lately and wanted to make a quick summary and overview of these types of pathologies since it's not just one simple diagnosis or pathology. There's actually many different things that can be going on at many different sites along the ulnar nerve. So uh, I'll just do a quick overview of ultrasound imaging and interventions. So the cubital tunnel on the medial elbow is the most common site for ulnar nerve entrapment, but as you'll see, it can happen in a lot of different places. When it passes through, when the ulnar nerve passes through the uh, cubital tunnel, it's normally around four to five millimeters in cross-sectional area, four to five millimeters squared, I should say. And uh, I had this patient just this last week who was a climber, and I did this uh, di diagnostic ultrasound imaging on his elbow, and right away it just jumped out at me. The cross-sectional area it looked huge. It turned out to be over 20 millimeters squared. The nerve tends to dilate like that because there's an impediment to axonal plasmic flow, which impedes nutrients and things being able to get to the nerve terminals. And these nerves are big, long, single cells, basically. Each axon is its own cell that has to supply energy all along the cell to repair and, and help the, the cell do its job. So if there's an impediment to that, you get those neuropathic types uh, symptoms. And I won't go into all the details of how it presents clinically, but it's important to do a very thorough uh, neurological exam for these. So uh, on imaging, this was very apparent, and it turned out that uh, it was entrapped just at the entry to the cubital tunnel under a ligament called Osborne's ligament, um, which is also known as the cubital retinaculum. And so with this, I just did a simple uh, injection and this one was in plane. You can do them in plane or out of plane with ultrasound. But um, going under Osborne's ligament there and uh, es essentially infiltrating the canal in the nerve sheath with uh, corticosteroid, a long acting and a short acting. And um, I also had another patient who presented. He, he had brought me his own MRI, actually, which they had said was a normal MRI. And uh, MRI is not great at picking these out because it can't see neuropathies and even um, mild or recent nerve entrapments aren't going to show up very well. MRI, even with pretty good magnetic strength, will only take a few millimeter thick slices. So it doesn't get down to millimeter or submillimeter resolution like ultrasound can. So uh, for nerve, sometimes ultrasound is actually a better to diagnostic tool and interventional tool, certainly. So um, with, with this, again, it was an entrapment under Osborne's ligament and very obvious and apparent on ultrasound, even though it didn't really show up on MRI very well. So <clears throat> Again, this is just another out of plane injection. And again, you want to kind of scan up and down the nerve just to make sure that you're getting good spread and that it's where you think it is and that it's moving around the nerve in a good way. Sometimes I'll do it above and below the injection site just to make sure that I'm getting really good spread and loosening up all those connective tissues and fibrous bands around the nerve. And I'll show you an image later of those fibrous bands that I'm talking about. Now, I also had a patient, um, this one was a couple months ago, I guess, but this was an ulnar nerve entrapment at the arcade of Struthers or the intermuscular. It was actually a little higher than that. It was at this sort of medial intermuscular septum. And it had, it was really obvious, um, the fibrosis around the nerve and the nerve was significantly dilated over what it should be. So you can see the nerve is dilated next to the humerus bone. And so this is up in the arm above the cubital tunnel, but then you see the nerve here dive down into the cubital tunnel. Now, uh, to get to this, it's a pretty easy injection. It's actually easier to do it in the arm than it is to do it down at the cubital tunnel. Um, so, it was basically just a matter of dissecting into the fascia that was thick and surrounding the nerve and, and getting that good spread into the nerve sheath and into the fibrous bands so that it would 
be able to loosen up those tissues. And uh, I should say also that that climber who I did just about a week ago, he already called me back and said that he could sleep for the first time in months, that he could finally feel like a good grip strength for the first time in months. And so with that short acting steroid, you can get pretty quick and significant relief. And what else is um, interesting about these is that they are, at least some studies have shown, they are somewhat predictive of how well you'll respond to um, uh, nerve release surgically or uh, nerve transposition. But obviously it makes more sense to do the minimally invasive option and not jump to a big surgery. Most patients get really good relief after a single injection. Occasionally I have had patients come back a significant time later for maybe a second or a third, but that's pretty rare. Um, now, the steroid is working in many different ways. It helps lubricate the canal to help the nerve glide. It helps loosen up connective tissues. It suppresses scar tissue formation and inflammatory cycles, and it calms the nerve down. So it's working in many different ways, but it does take time, and it acts over a substantial amount of time, over weeks to even months sometimes. So um, it does take a little patience, but it tends to have really good outcomes. Now, for some types of nerve injuries, I'll use regenerative agents as well. For example, platelet-rich fibrin, which uses uh, fibrin to form a biologic glue and scaffold. And it has been used by neurosurgeons for nerve repair for many years. And it can be done minimally invasively under ultrasound guidance, especially for uh, nerve avulsion type injuries. Okay, so we've talked about ulnar nerve entrapments and how ultrasound can help gauge the pathology and the severity and find the exact site of entrapment. And we've looked at ulnar nerve entrapments at the cubital tunnel and above the cubital tunnel with uh, the arcade of Struthers and uh, the intermuscular septum above that. But the uh, there there is a rare, I should mention, there is a rare um, variant where the Anconius epitrochlearis can also, it's not found in everybody, but people who have it tend to have a greater likelihood of developing ulnar nerve entrapment. But um, after the cubital tunnel, there's also the arcade of Osborne and another intermuscular septum between the medial and lateral heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. And uh, so that's what's happening in this patient. You can see between the two heads, the olecranon head and the medial head, that there is a, a fibrous entrapment and you can actually see um, the hyperechoic uh, f fibrous um, band around the nerve and the dilation of the nerve. So I just came in uh, from the olecranon side and did a fairly shallow injection into this space to help uh, basically hydrodissect and add more space in that intermuscular septum there. And here is an actual image of a dissection showing the ulnar nerve uh, extending below the cubital tunnel, but showing the types of fibrous banding that can occur, this sort of scar tissue formation. And, uh, you know, I, it just seems like in, in patients who have this predisposition to this inflammatory cycle of neuropathies and nerve impingements that these fibrous bands do tend to lay down and cause mild entrapments at multiple sites, which I'll talk about a little later. Okay, so to finish up, the last common site of ulnar nerve entrapment is in Guillaume's canal. Uh, this is at the wrist and it is essentially covered by the volar carpal ligament or the roof. Um, and underneath the floor, you could say of this canal is the transverse carpal ligament, which then arches over and becomes the roof of the median nerve. But we're not going to talk about the median nerve today, but that's carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, this uh, Guillaume's canal syndrome, uh, you can see on this image, uh, it, the ulnar nerve passing through Guillaume's canal with the ulnar artery. And uh, it's important to note that you can get many different types of symptoms uh, based on where the exact entrapment of the ulnar nerve is in Guillaume's canal because the ulnar nerve starts branching into the motor branches for the intrinsic muscles of the hand as well as the sensory branches. So zone one, you can uh, impair both motor and sensory, but if you get a zone two entrapment, you only lose sensory, and then if you get a zone three entrapment, you only lose motor. So it's just kind of an interesting split there. 
Okay, another important thing to mention here, of course, is that uh, these nerve impingements may actually be presentations of radicular pain. So uh, any cervical nerve root compression, obviously you have to have a high level of suspicion for, and I'm gonna be posting that soon. Uh, a lot of cool stuff about interventions in the cervical spine. And uh, in addition, uh, like I mentioned with the fibrous banding, there can be subtle double hits to the nerve, um, this double hit hypothesis where you get mild entrapments at these fibrous bands, but uh, when you have multiple uh, mild impairments, it's enough to cause the same symptoms as if you had one main site of severe impingement. And the reason for that is because you're still impairing the axonal plasmic flow and uh, clearance of metabolites and delivery of energy, especially down to the nerve terminals. So it's an interesting phenomenon that I think warrants a lot more research and which I think will enable many more types of interventions in a minimally invasive way that really empower both our diagnostics and our uh, therapeutic approach to these types of nerve pathologies. So thank you everybody.